today, Lord. We're grateful for the truth of your word. We're grateful that you saved us out of some really horrible situations, and you've healed us, and all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And your goodness is running after us. It's chasing us down. And as we absorb the word today, Lord, let it be nourishment to our soul. Let it be, like Jesus said, to be about our Father's business, that our nourishment will be to do the will of our Father. And that's how we want to leave here today, encouraged, Lord, by the power of your word, and especially this word, agape, which is the God kind of love that we all want to grow into more this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I already tipped you off a little bit. I'm going to be talking about agape. And some people say agape. I know I'm, I'm just going to go by what I looked at. I call it agape. And this is one of the pictures that the Lord gave me about especially what's going on these days and all the, what, what would you say, the turmoil that's come about by Roe versus Wade being reversed and the, the violence that has taken place in some places. But, you know, we've been part of a prayer movement for a really long time, and this was always very, very high on the list that this would happen. So I think we need to give a hand to the Lord for the breakthrough that took 49 years of prayer. My, my. I remember meeting Dutch Sheets about, I don't know, I think it was over 20 years ago down at Rick Joyner's ministry, and he was talking about how he had been just leaning in on behalf of, of all the unborn children that were being murdered. And, um, you know, we believe that the Bible teaches that life begins at inception, not 15 weeks, not heartbeat. That, that, that's a miracle. So if you disagree, you might be in the wrong church. But uh, we realize there's, there's always trade-offs. There's going to be some situations that, that you would say, gee, what a shame, right? But if you stick with the word and you trust the Lord, things work out really well. You get blessed in the obedience when you follow the word. And that's what we're going to be talking about because there's a linkage in scripture between truth and love. All right? And what's love got to do with truth? You know, if you talk to people in the world that are atheists, who you shouldn't hate, by the way, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You might be the only Jesus they ever meet. So if you're coming across real argumentative and judgmental and acting like you hate them, then, you know, the Bible says they're going to know we're Christians by our hate. No, they're going to know that we're Christians by, but not just love, agape love. Like, there's a big difference in Scripture about the kinds of words that are used for love. And agape can only be given to us by God. And, you know, just as a high-level understanding of what we're going to talk about today, the world tries to take a lot of the scriptural principles, especially about helping the poor. But without agape, you burn out. Because the only person that can give you agape love is the Lord. And if you don't have that, you run out of strength pretty quickly. Because you're trying to do it in your own energy, and you're trying to do it in some cases just to salve your conscience that you're doing something to help people. But it's got to be driven by the Lord. And, and I'm just going to try to unpack some scriptures for you on that. Another way I said it was God's love is essential to truth. All right? And if, if an atheist was here and we were debating, they would completely disagree with that. All right? Because we'll, we'll get into why. But truth is, is at play today. Really always has been for thousands of years, this whole idea of what really is true, who's really a good person, how do I become a good person, the world will just tell you that's completely random based on what your philosophy, and we all have a different one. So you do your thing, I'll do mine. And we're saying, no, there really is something higher level than anything we can come up with on our own. Because God's ways are high above our ways. His thoughts are high above our thoughts. And if we think that we can throw aside thousands of years of wisdom and truth and everything that our former generations have taught us, we are full of pride, and only a fool, the Bible says, would say in his heart, come on, you know it, there is no God. Now, they may not think it's the God that Jesus represents and the Holy Spirit represents, but more and more people are saying, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And it does say in the Bible that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on 
not some, on all flesh. So who knows that that's not that stirring on the inside. They don't want to use this version because they think we're so restrictive and that we don't want them to have a good time and that Christians are, what, prudes. <laughs> and uh, little do they know that, especially in the area of sexual sin, that there's much more going on than just the physical transaction that happens there's a very deep spiritual thing that's going on there. But the devil has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers. And unless you receive him, nobody can force you to do it. The door of your heart has to open and then he'll come in. But he doesn't force his way in. But when you receive him, wow, what a gift, what a change. How the light bulbs go on. I once was blind and now I see. And that was a verse in the Bible where... Uh, the man had been blind, and Jesus put clay on his eyes, and he went down and washed in the pool of Siloam, and he could see. And the Pharisees were very upset about this, because <laughs> Jesus wasn't from the right church. <laughs> so they even called the parents. Well, you know, like, what's going on here? Is this your son? And was he born blind? Well, this is my son. And yes, he was born blind, but we don't know how he got healed. He's an adult. Just ask him. <laughs> And then this man, who really probably didn't have the same training, they were saying, well, who is he and what authority? And he's like, I don't know. I just know when I left the house this morning, I was blind. Been blind my whole life. And now I see. Well, that's not from God. And this man, like you know, I said, like, well, that's pretty good. Because if he's not from God, nobody's ever heard of anybody opening the eyes of a blind man. So you think he's from the devil? I think he's a prophet. And they said, well, who are you to try to teach us? You were born in sin. And he probably said, well, I could see. <laughs> they thought they weren't born in sin. Like, this is one of these big humbling things that happens when you're a Christian, right? Like, reality is what you run into when you're wrong. <laughs> you thought life was going to work a certain way. Nope, sorry. That's a tuition payment in the school of life. <laughs> you were wrong. That could be very expensive, can't it? We won't go there. Well, I use the text verse for John chapter 1 in the voice. Verse 10 is the first verse. It says, he entered our world, a world that he made, yet the world did not recognize him. And today, there are many people that don't recognize Jesus. If you think of who the most brilliant person in history was, it's Jesus. Okay? There are nobody second. Close to second. But if you ask the average person on the street, they say Einstein or whoever. Snooky on Jersey Shore. She probably wouldn't make the finals. But, like, they don't want it to be Jesus because they don't want all these clamps on their life. My body, my choice. See, oh, yes, that's true. It's your choice. This is just better choices, man. Like, we have found that to be true. Anybody else who want to help me out, be a little Pentecostal here? This is the best choice you could ever make. Is it easy? No. Who said it was going to be easy? Most things in life that are worth having aren't that easy. But it gets easier the more you submit. So he entered the world, but they rejected him. They didn't recognize him, and they're still rejecting him. Even though he came to his own people, they refused to listen and receive him. There's that word again, receive him. That's the first step. You have to open the door of your heart and receive him. There's that famous verse in, in Revelation where he's standing at the door and knocking. But there's no handle on the outside in the painting. That's brilliant, right? So until you reach that point, many of us have said rock bottom. Until we were ready to hate what we were doing so much that we were willing to do whatever it took. Anybody else besides me had hit rock bottom before I said yes to the Lord. It wasn't somebody trying to convince me in an argument that this was the right thing to do. I knew I was broken. And I tried everything else and nothing else helped until I received him. I opened the door and said, you know what? Nothing else has worked. I might as well try you because I got nothing to lose but depression and anger and suicidal thoughts and wanting to kill other people, just the normal run-of-the-mill sin, you know, just regular stuff. It doesn't mean you have to hit rock bottom, but it does mean you have to identify that there's a problem called sin and that you can't save yourself. I know a lot of you know that, but maybe somebody's watching who didn't know that. 
He bestowed, wow, this is really good news. He bestowed this birthright. All who did receive him and trust in him, he gave the right to be reborn as children of God. So Michael Rowe was born to his family, and now he can be a second birth. He can be born a second time, and he can be born into the children of God. He'll become a son of the Most High God. What a privilege that is. It must be hard to get that one. How much does that cost? Well, you don't have to pay the tuition because somebody else paid the tuition for you. Jesus. It cost him everything. Why? I never filled out an application. Agape. That's why. You didn't get the love because you deserved it. You got the love because of how good he is. You can't earn it. So, yeah, but if you knew my life... Nobody's too far away from God. All who did receive him and trust in him, he gave the right to be reborn as children of God. He bestowed this birthright, not by human power or initiative, but God's will. I'm going to just say something maybe a little radical, but I'm a Bible freak. Anybody else here a Bible freak? Yeah, that's a really good thing. Jesus freak, Bible freak. You can be that kind of freak here anytime you want. But I was just curious because the more I was reading up to prepare for today, I'm like, John, man, he talks about love more than anybody else you read about. Like we think of Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, that's a love chapter. A lot of people in the world even know that. Can go to a wedding and you hear about love is patient, love is kind, right? But, man, I just had to count. I'm kind of geeky this way. And in John Gospel 1, and 1, 2, 3 of the epistles, he mentions the word truth 42 times and love 73 times. And in the other three Gospels and the book of Acts, truth is mentioned nine times, verses 42, and 28 times for love, verses 73. This guy, John, had a revelation on truth and love. And at the top it says, God's love is essential to truth. I'm going to try to make that case today, even though you're not opposing me. But just in case there was an atheist here or somebody who didn't know the Lord could say, well, how come nobody else ever told me that? Well, the Bible's talking about spiritual warfare all the time. You have an enemy that wants to take you out. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have abundant life. This rich life, an eternal life, already while you're here. Yes, it'll be great when we get to the other side, but it can be great right now. Certainly greater. <laughs> Maybe still be some things wrong, because just because you become a Christian doesn't mean nothing ever goes wrong. But you have a whole new toolbox. Carl's like the president of the Toolbox Flan Club back there. He's a hungry man. Like, he just digs in, and he wants to know more because he's seeing such a change in his life. Isn't that awesome? How much did it cost? Nothing. Cost Jesus everything. Cost us discipline. Cost us a decision to say, I'm serious about this. And let the chips fall where they may. If my friends think I'm weird because I don't want to party anymore. I don't want to go do the things we used to do. But, you know, you might be the only Jesus they ever meet, so be careful about just tossing them to the side. And then I'm going to just give you a little test. Don't you hate tests? This is like one of those unannounced tests. It's just going to be true or false. You'll get this quickly. Ready? Say yes. yes. All right. So true or false. Every person follows a type of truth compass that guides his or her decisions. Yes. You're right. True. Truth is relative. Your truth works for you and mine works for me. Don't judge me and lock me in your bad behavior jail cell. Thank you. You're good students. My body, my choice, all truth is inconvenient to somebody. Ah, this is a tricky one, isn't it? Ooh, got to watch. Look, look at that. It's not good to give trick questions because then they don't want to answer the next one. So. It's not good, but it's true. It is your body, and it is your choice, and all truth is inconvenient to somebody. <laughs> so you want to be on the side of the truth, not some random truth, because you're making some bad choices with your body. Not if you follow this. He loves us so much that he said, I know you're not going to like this one, but do it. Just do it by faith. Step out of the boat by obedience. I don't care if it looks impossible. Even when you don't see it, I'm working on your behalf. I'm the way maker. When there is no way, I make the way. 
I know the end from the beginning, he says about himself. What a God. This costs nothing. It costs Jesus everything. How about the Father, the cost to the Father to send his only begotten Son? And how about that he would give us his Spirit to live inside of us? The same hovering Spirit that was in Genesis chapter 1, hovering over all the chaos, lives inside of you. When you receive him, you get Holy Spirit. Actually, you had him already because you can't say yes to receive him unless he was in there already. So that's back to that pouring out his spirit on all flesh. This is so profound. How about this one? To succeed, true and false now, to succeed, follow your heart and listen to its instructions. Terrible idea. Often, your truth compass will require a dangerous yes. Boy, that's a tough one. I thought he loved me. He does. There's lots of danger out there. Be obedient to him. How about this one? Love means never having to say you're sorry. The dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> That's from a movie from 1970. False. Christianity is all about repentance. You start with repentance and saying you're sorry. The second dumbest thing I ever heard. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Shut up. That's a bad idea. <laughs> How about this one? Human nature is good. Trust people to do the right thing. We're from New Jersey. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> well, we want to believe there's good in people because there is, but there's still that enough sin in that original sin that we inherited that even though somebody's looking like they have a very successful life, there's no human being ever born that wouldn't be better off receiving the Lord. That's your maker. That's your creator. You don't need to be Einstein to figure this all out. He didn't come for, he came for Einstein too, but not just for Einstein. He came for every human being. Even people you and I might look at and say, oh, no, there can't be much good in that person. You have no idea. No idea. Just look at the history of the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. What his history is and where he came from to be in the highest office in the land. Amazing. Amazing. The people you and I might think could never make it. Oh, my God. There's a story of a doctor. One of my clients retired, and he was cleaning out. Um, um, uh, not re he did retire, but his mom passed away, and he was cleaning out the boxes. And there was a story from Reader's Digest of a doctor who, from the 1930s, knew that the baby, that the, the, the mom that was in there was going to have a baby. And when he went in to do a, a check, he, he could see that the leg was missing, that the, that the baby was going to be born with terrible deformities, and he told the nurses not to let the child be born and make it look like it was just a breech birth. And he said he lived, I mean, he was the one that was writing this story, and he said he lived with that pain for years and years and years. And one year in the hospital, they had a Christmas play, and they were up on the altar. The band was there, and they were playing that song, Oh Holy Night. And he said, I wasn't the only one, you know, old curmudgeon who's a teardrop came down because that's such an amazing song. And a lady comes up to him and says, oh, doctor, do you remember me? And it was the mom. The baby wasn't aborted. The baby was born, even though the nurses were trying not to let it happen. But the strength of the body just pushed it out. And she was born without a leg. And the parents had to suffer for a long time because of that. I still have this in my archives. It's amazing. And he says, have you seen her? Have you seen my baby? The one that you delivered? She was the one that had been up on the altar playing the harp. And she had a prosthetic leg, and she came walking down. And the mom says, this is my angel. And it's all because of you. Oh, conviction. What if, what if it had worked and, I, and the baby died? I can't judge another life. Jesus never does that. He doesn't ever do this. We do. Whether we do this or not, another day. God's love is essential to truth. Genesis chapter 2. Look, yeah, this might sound really basic, but 
I want to just make this point. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat it, how many waiting to meet them when you get to heaven? Ladies, thinking about when you're having your baby and that original sin came in and labor is from Eve, telling me you had eight kids and you go up to Eve when you get to heaven and say, really? You had to eat it? Could have saved me a whole bunch of problem. The men can't relate to that one. This is the first commandment. It's not one of the ten. It doesn't say he suggested, does he? Ah, uh -uh, the Lord commanded him not to eat of it. And okay, but she wasn't there when God told Adam, and maybe Adam missed something on the way in the translation. But man, what a problem. That's when sin entered into the world, okay? And what was the issue? They, God is saying, don't eat of the knowledge of good and evil. There's something about our makeup that he never intended us to try to be equal to him to understand good and evil. He wanted us to be obedient to what he was going to tell us to do. And in the garden, they had perfect fellowship with him. So they didn't need anything written down. They were sons and daughter of the living God. And then they're kids. But now, once she eats of it, and it's his fault, not hers. He should have been there protecting him. Just always make that point so I don't get male. <laughs> you shall surely die. The first lie is you will not surely die. He's good at this, isn't he? Satan. Now he had been in heaven, he had had a high position of authority, and he was booted. And misery loves company. So if he got booted, he's got an orphan spirit, and he wants you to have an orphan spirit. He doesn't want you to know God as a father. And he tells her, you can handle the knowledge of truth and evil. Can I just say, no, you can't. I don't care how bright you are. The most famous atheist in the world, Sam Harris, he's not smart enough to handle good and evil. He's really smart, but none of us can handle it. And this is the last thing we want to hear because we want agency. We want to be able to make our own decisions. I don't need anybody. Well, look, it's your choice. It's a free country still, I think. But this is a choice, too. And now you know too much because we told you. <laughs> your eyes will be open. God knows that when you eat, of you, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's a lie. He's the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said about Satan. And there's only two choices. You're following God or you're following Satan. He's the God of this world. And you don't... You, well, Call me up after, we can talk. So in this book by Peter Wagner, it's called Spiritual, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Supernatural Forces in Spiritual Warfare. I've covered this once before, but I just want to hit it again because there was a couple of things that I saw. Because this, this author in this chapter 9 of this book that Peter Wagner put together said that there's a dungeon of collective captivity. Isn't that a great phrase? America right now, could you see some collective captivity around politics and about choosing sides and about the things get, get put up on Facebook or who gets canceled, or who gets deplatformed, disinformation? Never heard of any of these words. What's disinformation, by the way? True or false? Like, if it's false, that's called misinformation. No, disinformation. We got to come up with our own words so then we can make up the definition. <laughs> we got by for 2,000 years without that one. Anyway, Trisha turned my fan around and I'm getting hot. So. <laughs> it starts at the bottom. Can you see that little clock? If you go to 6 o'clock, it says distraction. That's where the whole thing starts is distraction. Now, remember, 1988, this was written. There was no Internet. There was no social media. How about distraction? Is that a problem today? Say yes. All right, so it, you know, the word they use is clickbait. So you're, you're going about your business, you're getting an email, or you're going to check Facebook, and boom, somebody's sending something to you that they think you're going to want to click on, right? And they pay for that. A lot of money to pay for that clickbait. And you say to yourself, well, that's interesting to me. And there's two things. It's either pornography, something to do with lust, or rage. 
They know that if they keep pushing your rage button, and do you know what the opposite party did? Then whatever party you're in doesn't really matter. It's not much of a party these days, is it? It feels a lot less like the parties I used to go to. It's screaming people. You're just screaming at each other. And if you're not on my side, you're the enemy. No, they're not. The devil is our enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. All right? Well, you know, it's harmless. Anybody? Come on. Can you relate? I don't have a problem in that area. This is no big deal. I'm not. I'm not having a problem with that. Oh, yeah, we all said that. And I'm an adult. Stop treating me like a child. I can handle my own stuff. This is exactly what the devil said. You can handle the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, try it out. See how it works out. And you know what? If this was a problem, I could quit if I wanted to. Try it. Really? You could quit? Try. See what happens. Somebody gave me an mm. <laughs> Who's looking at his phone, by the way. I hope that's not a sign. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you, Andrew. Here's another word. It becomes habituated. And now we don't even realize it because we're moving up the cycle. It started out with a stimulus, and then I tried it, and then I convinced myself I don't have a problem. But it's a habit now. And once it's a habit, you don't even think about it anymore. You just do it. Every morning when you wake up, you go check something, and you're scrolling the screen. Not you, of course. These are people that are watching online. And then it becomes an addiction. And addictions become abusive. I won't go into all the ways that can happen. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be addicted. Maybe reading your Bible, but even there, the letter of the law can kill. The Spirit gives life. And then, then there's always destructive behavior somewhere in the chain of an addiction. You, you damage your family. You damage your relationships. This is not God. God brings life. God brings trust. Addictions bring lies and mistrust. It's the fruit of the enemy. And you may not be dealing with an addiction, but you know somebody who is. And if they're hiding it really well, well, that doesn't mean they're not dealing with it. The world needs Jesus. Can we just say that as a church? Like, they need what the Lord has to offer. And if they don't hear from us, they might not hear it. And then there's that great word, intervention, which gets overused. It can work in an, in an addiction, but you can't do it more than once effectively. So if you're going to do it, you better pull out all the guns. That's the only way it's going to work, because then the person could even go further in the other direction. And if it's an intervention, that person's in a really bad place. There's been a whole lot of abuse and a whole lot of destructive behavior. The only person, the only uh, entity that I know of to completely flip the script on this is Jesus Christ. It's salvation, Holy Spirit, getting in the Word. But don't underestimate this power of all of us in this room right now. That's what agape means. It's the kind of love that only God can give. But when we do it together... There's an amplification and a multiplication, and we're willing to hold each other accountable to what the standard is. Anybody here ever had a blind spot in your life? Come on, don't smile at me. Just raise your hand. Let's be honest. That could be another blind spot. <laughs> that was mean. But what happens is once it gets exposed and people do an intervention, that means everybody else knew what you've been hiding. And now it's not fun anymore. The thrill is gone. I've been found out. So I'll just stop. Well, maybe you'll just trade addictions. Because something new now is bound to attract you because you're not getting to the core of your dissatisfaction. When Jesus met the woman at the well, it was to give her water? No, what was she really thirsty for was relationships. She had been through five, and now was on her sixth one. He just used the water because it was convenient to where he was standing. That's what Holy Spirit does for us. Well, if you drink the water I have, you'll never be thirsty again. She didn't know he meant it. You'll stick with one person, and it will be the right person, Boaz, not Bozo, or many other names we could give. Well, she had had six Bozos. She was due for a Boaz. How many photographers did she hire for her wedding? And how many times? Thank you cards. So you have two choices. And I don't mean to make fun of her. She became a phenomenally powerful Christian in the early church. She became an evangelist. 
Talk about flipping the script. The whole city got saved because she got saved. So I'm not making fun of her. I'm, I'm just reflecting on my own life. It was, a, it was a mess. And I thought I was hiding it. I wasn't hiding it. So two choices of collective captivity. One is that you just transfer to a different dungeon. When is the message going to get happy today, Pastor? This isn't too happy. Well, the good news is there's a number two here. I'm still only on number one. So what happens is as, as it starts to diminish and the thrill is gone, you just get hooked in the next thing. But he, his argument is it's a deeper dungeon. Because if it's pornography, you were, you were kind of at one level, but you don't get satisfied till you get to a deeper level. I already know this one. i got to get to a deeper level. That's what the devil does. You're never satisfied. He lies to you and tells you it will be. But look at this verse, Proverbs 20, 27, verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. That's the lie. You'll be, this will make you happy. And as a financial advisor, I've met very wealthy people that were not happy. The money isn't this guarantee. I met some that were, mostly Christians, but plenty that weren't. So don't think, you know, read about people who win the lottery. Many will say it's the worst thing that ever happened to them. Wow, talk about a lie. But here's the other transfer you can make. Get out of the dungeon. Transfer into the kingdom of God. Become a Christian today. You can do it right now, no cost. You're here already. Come up to the altar. I'm just telling you, give Jesus a chance. Everybody here would tell you it's worth it. It's the best decision that you could ever make. So I'm going to go a little faster. Okay, so it says, whoever does not love, agape love, does not know God, because God, come on, you knew that already. Before you got here, if you're a Christian, you knew this one. You know that God is love. But it also says in Numbers 23, 19, that God is not a man that he should lie. So that means God is also truth. He's truth and love together. And like I said, John talks about truth and love more than all the other people put together. Amazing revelation that John had. John was the apostle who was laying his head on the breast of Jesus, right, at the, at the Last Supper. And they said, ask him, who is it? Who's going to betray him? John had this amazing connection with the Lord. Hebrews 6.18 says, it was impossible for God to lie. And then John 3.16, which we sang today, God so agape the whole world, the whole human race, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Why does that matter today? You would probably know that there's four different words in Greek for love, and this is a common word, agape, in the Greek culture. It was, it represented a sacrificial love, a kindness towards somebody else, even though they might not respond to you the way you would like, but the New Testament writers were the first to say agape was there to describe the kind of love that God has for the whole human race. So this was a step further than what they were used to thinking about that word. And then the Christian agape concerns for somebody's spiritual welfare. It's not just feeding them. When we go out on Tuesdays and hand out food, it's not just for the food. It's also, can we pray for you? And where are you guys from? Oh, well, we're from King of Kings, and, and we're here, no strings attached. Just if you want to come to church, great, but there's no requirement to get the food. We just, we just believe that Jesus said that we should help people. As we've been helped, we want to help other people. No strings attached, because he did say that. And then it says, only God can produce agape in the believer. The love of God for God to believers and to the lost. You guys tracking? All right? It, this is a different kind of love that has to be birthed only in the Holy Spirit and only in the truth that doesn't change the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Word of God. Our interpretations might differ about certain things. Okay, fair enough. But let's have a short list of what we disagree about. And let's just focus on salvation, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died, he lived a perfect life, he died, and he literally rose from the dead. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives in me. Yeah, you don't need to be Einstein to figure that one out. So there's your agape cross. The love of God is this way. The love for God, I, the way I see it at least, is our foundation and why we dig in and we study the word. The love of God 
this way is worship and praise and spending time listening for the downloads that he wants to give us. The love for God it tells me that I'm going to do some things to show that I mean this, that, I, that my behavior follows after what I'm saying. Does my walk match my talk? And then love for believers would be what we're doing today. But how about love for the lost? Right? Because somebody loved you when you were lost. Yes? Yeah. Hmm. A real person, not just Jesus loved you, yes, but somebody witnessed to you. And why do we get comfortable and forget to do this? That's a big problem. We shouldn't forget to do this. So that word receive really matters. And once they receive, there's two things that we like to teach here. First thing you do is, actually three, but you renounce whatever other idolatry that you had. And that's a big topic, right? But it wasn't the Lord. He wasn't on the seat of your throne. Something else was and still can be trying to fight for that place on your heart. But no, stop doing that. We renounce idolatry. And then there's this process of sanctification that happens that is taking what was once dirty and misused and you lost your innocence from the difficulties of life. Defiled is another good word. So he sanctifies us, but then he transforms us. And that's an amazing process that only Jesus can do. The word in, in the Bible is metamorphosis. So you actually change your nature, and you go from being what was a person who was far from God to now having access to God. And that's why being with other believers that are serious about their faith really matters, because there's a power to unbelief. And when we gather people together that all don't believe but say they're Christians, it's harder to get healed in that situation. It says Jesus could do no healing in his own town because they took him for granted. They were too familiar. And if you were born and raised in church sometimes, you're too familiar. You, you, you lost Jesus. How about giving him another chance? How about not thinking of him as dead religion but thinking I can have a relationship with a loving God who's not trying to judge me? He's not angry at me. And this says of Acts chapter 2, whoever made a place, whoever received the Lord, whoever made a place for his message in their hearts, received the baptism, the community continually committed themselves to learning what the apostles were teaching them. That's what we do when we come together. And you heard Tim say it, Wednesday night it was about prayer. and We're getting more and more people coming out on a Wednesday night because we can. Just don't stay home. Just get out of the house. Be around other believers. Sometimes it might be for you. Sometimes you might be there to help somebody else. But that's what we do. We're part of a family. And let, let's not minimize that. Gathering for fellowship, breaking bread, and praying. We so forget how important this is. Gather together, break bread, and pray together. There was an intense sense of togetherness among the believers. They shared all their material possessions. They sold goods they didn't benefit the community and used that money to help everyone in need. You know, and some people hear the story of the rich young ruler, and they think that Jesus wants to give everything away, all of us to give everything away. That was what that man was told to do. That doesn't mean everybody has to do it, because you go read Paul's letters, and he said, charge those that are rich among you to be rich in good works. He didn't say give it all away. Be rich in good works. Let the money be used to advance the kingdom. Another sermon someday. Here, this is a good one. Speak the truth in love. Whoo! That's like an advanced degree in kingdom theology, isn't it? Because a lot of times the people that speak the truth don't come across as being very loving, do they? <laughs> but we're to grow up. Look at somebody say, grow up. And just quoting scripture. Just quoting scripture. <laughs> we're all supposed to grow up in every way into him. Ah, that's a different story. It's who's the head, who's Christ. So speak the truth in love, we grow up. When we live together with people that we trust, who we know have our benefit, who can speak to us truth, even though it's hard to hear, but we trust them, then we change. The world doesn't do this. The world cancels people. There's no forgiveness in the cancel culture of the woke people. They find out something you did in high school 50 years ago, boop, gone. <laughs> what do they call it in China? can't remember the word now, but it's like the person evaporated. They don't exist anymore. Disappeared. Yeah, that's now a noun. <laughs> Are you a Republican or Democrat? You're a disappeared. <laughs> you don't exist anymore. Whoo! I sure like America. <laughs> 
Speak the truth in love and grow up into, in every way into him, the head from whom the whole body, all of us, not just your body, all of us, our body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped within each part working properly. Oh, could I spend time on that? So if every one of us here was fully operating in all the gifts that the Lord gave us, which is our goal for that to happen, then we all get stronger. As each part gets stronger, because we're connected, we all get stronger. Working properly, it makes the body, all of us, grow so that it, the body, builds itself up in this God kind of love, not what the world has to offer. I will pray to the Father and he'll give you another helper, Jesus said, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. What a name for Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth because he's the Spirit of God and God is truth, but God is also agape love. The world doesn't get this. They think they can apply biblical principles but rip out different pages that talk about only being faithful to one person. <laughs> well, you don't, get to, you don't get to rip out pages. The whole book's there for all of us. Now, that spirit of truth, the world cannot see because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him. For he dwells in you and will be with you. I'm sorry, in you and with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's a picture of me and my grandfather from the year 19, none of your business. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he probably wouldn't have been like, you know, the born again, spirit filled Christian that you and I would know. But he was a very godly man in his own way. You know, he had been raised in a different denomination, but he lived life. You know, he was a merchant marine and he had his own place that he built this little diner. And, you know, he used to work the front counter and then people would come in and order something. And he'd yell in the back and say, Give me a burger. Then he'd walk in the back and cook it. <laughs> It's like, hey, Jim, make me a burger, and then he'd go do it. You know, my mother said that many times that the, her mother went in, he would be still on his knees. He had fallen asleep on his knees praying. So that tells me he knew. And I remember many times he spoke the truth in love. I didn't know that's what you called it then, but he was very firm with people that he loved. And he did it in a way that they knew he loved him, even though it was hard for them to hear. And this is one that I really remember. If something's not right, it's wrong. <laughs> Pretty profound, right? He had no college. He had the college of life. And this is what he arrived at. It was a great conclusion. I heard this a lot. I won't even go into all of it, but man, that was so valuable. We all need that compass. We all have a compass, but we have to re keep redirecting it to the true north of Jesus. Almost done. He missed it, <laughs> or he's happy. <laughs> While Paul was waiting at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. Anybody ever have this happen, where your spirit gets provoked within you? And, like, you don't know why, but you're just agitated in the spirit, and that's what's happening. As he saw the city was full of idols, and the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers spoke with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And that's how the atheists would treat the Christian today. What is, this is the babbler that believes in Noah's Ark and believes in the virgin birth and the resurrection. Like, this is all some big God in the sky. They took him and brought him to the Aragopagus, and the people there, I believe, were putting him on trial. And they were leaning in like, hey, can we know what this new teaching is that you have? And he just on his feet gave them this beautiful sermon about the unknown God. You've got a statue to an unknown God. I know that God, and I want to introduce you to him. And this is what the world would say on that hill. This is all the intellect of all the philosophers. They've got all their ideas about what truth is. And of all those things on there, Jesus isn't on there. Right? Because they don't want it to be Jesus. It's too restrictive. But once you know him and you love him, you're glad that he put boundaries around your life because they're healthy boundaries. And that's why he said, I am the way. That's the name of God. I am. And Jesus is saying, I represent him. You need a way. You need a compass. Follow me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You want to get to the Father, you come through the Son. I'm summarizing. 
And then I love this phrase. I know it's not easy to grasp it in the beginning when you first hear it, but, but truth, authentic truth is anti-fragile. It gets stronger when it gets tested. People have been punching at that Bible for thousands of years, and it's stronger now than it's ever been. Regardless of what you're seeing in society, Jesus Christ is still top of the list. Even the, the secular philosophers will tell you that the Sermon on the Mount is the greatest philosophy that's ever been written. They don't like saying it, because that then the next question is, well, why don't you follow him then? <laughs> so I have two more minutes, and then I'll be done. Now, for the third time, this is Paul. Now, for the third time, I'm ready to come to you again. Second Corinthians, he was pretty angry, right? He... he well, first Corinthians he was too, but he's saying, now for the second time, I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. So the implication was, by, by other people were falsely accusing Paul of wanting to do this for money. And, and, and this is, I, I will not be a financial burden to you. For I don't seek yours, but I seek you. What a powerful statement. I don't need what you have. I'm just looking for your heart. For the children, you guys, shouldn't lay up for the parents, me, Paul the apostle, but the parents, I'm supposed to be a resource for you. So when you come to King of Kings, I'm not asking you for anything. I'm here to serve you. That's the reminder. That's Jesus. That's the king. Now, being respectful to leaders is important. I get that. But, but there's role reversal here. You're supposed to kiss my ring? I know we're in New Jersey. You say kiss my something, you better be careful. You say ring right after that. And I will be very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Wow. I will very gladly be spent and spend for your souls. Even though, it says, the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved in return. Who would sign up for that job description? You're going to pour out your life for these people, and they're going to kick you while you're down. Sign me up. <laughs> Woohoo! I think I'll make tents. <laughs> I think that God displayed us, the apostles, last in line, this is another portion, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. That's in the Bible. We are famished, we're thirsty, and our clothes are practically rotted to pieces. We're homeless, hapless wanderers. But still we labor, working with our hands to meet our needs, because despite all of this, when a fist is raised against us, we respond with a blessing. That's agape. That could only be God. That's God's kind of love in us. When we face violence and persecution, we stay on mission. When others choose taunts and slander against us, we speak words of reconciliation and encouragement. That's what agape does. You got a motor inside you, and no matter what the outside is happening, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. You just keep bouncing back. You're like that little toy that just no matter what it hits, the, the things keep spinning, and you're going to find a way because you're on a mission. We stay on mission when they're trying to get us off mission. I'm not going to read that. It was really good, but we'll finish in Romans. Eight, chapter 8 of Romans, uh, you could spend a long time in there. This is near the end. He says, we know that for those who love God, let's stand, because this is good to do while we're standing together. For those that love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Is that you? Please raise your hand. Are you called according to his purpose? Do you believe that all things will work together for good? Even when I don't see it, he's working. Good. When then, what sh then shall we say to these things when people accuse us or they're coming against us or they're not grateful or they don't say thank you and the more I try to serve them, the less they love me in return. What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What a great thing for Paul to tell us because no matter what the world is saying, half the time, they don't want to believe what you're saying is true because it's going to mean too many changes. But that's the natural mind that's trying to wrestle with all that. They'll just keep saying, I know it might seem hard, but try it. Read the Bible. Well, I'll read it to just prove to you what a bunch of fairy tales it is. You go, yes. We don't care why they read it. Just get them to read it, right, John? Jehovah sneaky, man, every time. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. He who did not spare his own son but gave him for us all, how will he not also freely with him graciously give us all things? 
all things that he wants to give us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. No, all these things. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Is it easy? No. <laughs> Is it worth it? A little louder, please. Yeah. Not easy, but worth it. For I am sure that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all I would like today is if, if you caught a revelation of agape and you think you're a little bit in short supply and could use some more, lift your hands, okay? And just let's just ask him, not for the world's kind of love, which is still better than hate, but doesn't have what it takes to be sustained. Lord, we ask you for that agape kind of love. Love for you. Love for your word. Love for the brothers and sisters in the, in the church and in Christ, but also love for the lost. That we could all walk through this sanctification and transformation process because it's unlimited how far we can go in you and still continue to become more and more like you every day, every week, every month, every year, for as long as we're here. Lord, this path that you put us on is so rewarding and so open, and we want fruit that remains. We want fruit from our lives as we do things. It won't be worthless idolatry, but how we spend our time will be because we hear your voice and we're willing to be obedient to follow what you tell us to do. I bless your people that are here, those that are watching, that we will understand and get a revelation of agape love, not the love the world offers, but only what you can give us. And anybody that's here today, if you haven't received Christ, if you haven't opened the door and let him in, this would be the time to do it, okay? You don't have to hear anything more about it. You just have to be saying, you know what? I've tried everything else. It's not working. I'm willing to give Jesus a shot. And there's a bunch of people around here who would think that's the best decision that you could ever make. We're not going to embarrass anybody. We're not going to try to put you on the spot. But that's what this is here for. This is an altar. And when you come to an altar, you bring things that you want to give to God. So you say, I'm going to give you my sin. I'm going to give you my bad habits. I'm going to give you my destructive behavior. I'm going to give you my hatred for myself because I can't forgive myself for all the bad decisions I've made. He forgives it all. More than you even know could he forgive. Why? Because he loves us. So receive the love of God today. Say yes to him. Invite him in. Just let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart. I open the door and welcome you in. Set me free. Break the chains off my life so I can follow you unhindered. Know your word. Fill me with your spirit and connect me with other believers that are passionately in love with you so I can be too and serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, could you just pray? This is some of the hardest decisions people ever have to make because they have to walk away from other things. But Lord, we pray if there's anybody here in this room right now, they would come up to this altar and not be embarrassed, not be ashamed about it, but be willing to just say, you know what? Nothing else is working, and I'm willing to try Jesus. And would you help me? Would you help me, if you're a Christian already, would you help me try to understand the truth of the Word of God? Maybe a friend came with you, and they'll come up here with you. It's nothing embarrassing about it. You'll hear the loudest shout you ever heard if you come walking up here right now. I can tell you that. If it's for somebody at home, we bless you. Follow up, we'll email us, and we'll come back to you. We'll get you a Bible, and we'll make sure that you know exactly what to do next. Fall in love with Jesus. Amen. Could you lift your hands? I'll bless you guys. We go out today. We will have prayer at the altar here today, but you've got to go. Lord, we're grateful for the way you've touched our lives. Those of us that are believers here, there's nothing better. We ask you to keep that fire burning in our hearts. Breathe on the fire, and let the truth of your word just Come to the surface in everyday situations that we could apply your word. It's good to know it, but we have to know how to apply it. And Lord, I just bless your people for being hungry and willing to stay and dig in and hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name.